Can we render 3D objects using just characters in the terminal? Well, yes! Last time, we learned how to render 3D objects, just a bunch of vertices and edges, if you are looking at them in wireframe. And we talk about an important idea. If you really understand the core principles, you don't even need graphical output. Just printing text to the console can be enough. Now, let's take things a step further. Instead of simple cube we used before, we are going to update our code to load and display OBJ files. That means you can download any 3D model from the internet and load it right into your program. It's still wireframe for now, but there's a twist coming. You will see what I mean. If you haven't seen the previous episode, there's a link in the description. It might help to watch it for a bit of context, but don't worry. I'll also recap the key points here so you can follow along. Before we dive in, hey there! I'm Pavel, I work in game development and I'm a former graphics developer and researcher with a PhD in computer science. On this channel, we explore computer science topics in both practical and theoretical ways. Looking back at the code from the last episode, you'll see we had all the vertices and edges hard coded to draw a cube. But it's actually really easy to swap that out and render something else, like a pyramid, for instance. So let's define the vertices for a square based pyramid. We use five points in 3D space. The first vertex is minus one, minus one, minus one. The second, one, minus one, minus one. The third, one, minus one, one. The fourth, minus one, minus one, one. And the fifth one is on the top, the apex, at zero, one, zero. Now to connect them, we define edges, just pairs of vertex indices showing which points are connected. The base of the pyramid is square, so we connect the vertex zero to one, one to two, two to three, and three back to zero. Then we connect each base vertex to the apex at vertex 4, so 0 to 4, 1 to 4, and so on. That gives us the full wireframe of pyramid. But let's be honest, hard coding every model like this isn't practical. It would be much better if we could load different models from external files without touching the code every time. There are many formats for storing 3D models, FBX, USD, GLTF, P3D, uh, but to keep it simple, we are going with OBJ. It's one of the easiest formats to work with and really straightforward to read. An OBJ file uses plain text to describe a 3D model. It starts with vertices, each beginning with a V, followed by the X, Y, and Z coordinates. For example, a line like V100 represents a single point in 3D space. Now, instead of using edges like before, we'll think in terms of faces, which is more in line with how 3D data is handled in modern applications. Faces are usually triangles, so they still imply edges, but in a more structured way. A face is defined with the letter F, followed by the indices of the vertices that make up the face. For instance, F123 creates a triangle using the first, second, and the third vertices. OBJ files can also include a lot more, like normals, texture coordinates, materials, groupings, uh, but we'll skip all that for now. For our purposes, just the basic vertex and face data is more than enough. Uh, all right, let's explore some 3D models made up of the basic shapes like cube, pyramid, and tetrahedron. To keep things flexible, I've added a command line argument to load the model you want. If you are using Visual Studio, you can set this under properties, debugging. Just enter the file name and it will load the corresponding model. Simple and works as expected. Uh, now let's level things up and try some real models from the internet. For example, this male base mesh. Before we render it, I'm going to do something similar to what we did in the ASCII Ray Tracer episode. Force some control over the console font, uh, tweak the size and adjust the resolution to keep the aspect ratio correct. Just a heads up, this part only works on Windows and you will need to run the application or Visual Studio as administrator. Now, take a look. What you are seeing looks like a shaded surface, not just a wireframe. But don't be fooled, we are not rendering any actual surfaces here. What's happening is that we are drawing so many tiny triangles so densely packed that it gives the illusion of something smooth and solid. Let's try loading this sword model too. Yeah, that, that looks really cool. 
If we virtually zoom in a bit, you clearly see the wireframe structure underneath. Uh, it's still just blinds. Let's talk code. In the original program, the rendering pipeline is straightforward. A hard-coded cube is defined using two vectors, one for eight 3D points and another for 12 connecting edges. At runtime, the main function enters an infinite loop to animate the cube. Each frame begins by copying the vertices into a local vector, then rotating them using the rotate x and rotate y functions, which apply basic trigonometry. The rotated points are projected to 2D screen using the project function, which handles perspective and scaling. Then, the draw line is called for each edge using Bresenham's algorithm and depth-based shading. The screen is built as a character grid, converted to a string, and printed to the terminal. Rotation angles are updated each frame, and a short delay creates smooth animation. This version transforms the project from a simple cube spinner into a wireframe viewer that supports 3D models loaded from OBJ files. Several new header files were added to support these enhancements. Uh, the set header enables to use of a set container to store unique edges pairs and eliminate duplicates. We don't know what users will use in their external files, so better to expect suboptimal input. The fstream headers allows reading OBJ files from disk. The string stream header is used to break lines from the file into tokens for parsing. Uh, also, GNOME in Macs and Windows Edge were included to allow customization of the console phone on Windows. This allows characters display with the square aspect ratio. Thanks to that, the screen size has been increased from 80 by 40 to 170 by 170. You might need different size based on your display, just keep the same ratio as for the character size. The cube size constant was replaced with a more general model size, uh, scale up from 12 to 150, but again, it depends on you. Now, let's walk to the OBJ file loading function, which is at the heart of this upgrade. The function begins by opening the OBJ file using an input file stream. If the file cannot be opened, it prints an error message and exits the function. Once the file is opened, the existing vertex and edge data is cleared to make way for the new model. A separate vector named faces is initialized to temporarily store polygonal face data. The file is then read line by line using the standard getLine function. Each line is checked for emptiness or comments and skipped if necessary. The first word on the line determines the type of data. If the line begins with the letter V, it is a vertex definition. The parser reads three floating point numbers from the line using a string stream and stores them as XYZ coordinates. These coordinates are added to the model vertices vector. If the line begins with F, it represents a polygonal face. Each face vertex might be in formats like V, V slash, VT, and so on. The parser splits each token at the first slash and extracts only the vertex index. The standard function, string to integer, is used to convert the string to an integer. OBJ indices are one based, so they are adjusted to zero based for compatibility with C vectors. Negative indices, which count backwards from the end, are also supported. Only faces with at least three vertices are stored. We are going to assume that two vertices only are an error in data. Some OBJ files contain explicit line segments marked with L. These lines are parsed similarly, and consecutive pairs of vertex indices are directly added to the model edges vector. If no line segments are found, the program generates edges automatically from the face data. Each vertex in the face is connected to the next with wrapping at the end. To ensure no duplicates, a set of pairs is used. After parsing, the model is normalized. This ensures it is centered at the origin and scaled uniformly to fit within a unit cube. The code first calculates the bounding box of the model by finding the minimum and maximum values along each axis. It then computes the center point and the largest dimension. All vertices are translated and uniformly scaled so that the entire model fits within a range of minus one to one on each axis. This is good to do because you really shouldn't assume nice input data when grabbing something random from the internet. Once complete, the program prints the number of vertices and edges found. If no OBJ file was specified or if loading fails, it falls back to rendering a default cube. This new function sets the console font to square proportions. Don't forget you need to run the program or your IDE as administrator to use this. Also, it is Windows only. The program now supports command line arguments. If a file is provided, it attempts to load the specified OBJ model. This turns the tool from a static demo into a flexible viewer for any wireframe model. And that wraps up today's project. Next time, we are going to dive into actual surface rendering. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this and want to see more, hit the subscribe button. And I'll see you in the next one.